if we are looking for intelligent life in the galaxy, um, I mean, there are very simple things. We ourselves are intelligent life, so we can at least have a clue as to what other species such as ourselves could do. Um, one of the things we've done is send a message in a bottle, so to speak, on the Voyager probes, uh, which carry information about where we are located in space and also what we look like. And then some um, of the images here are trying to communicate that we're intelligent because we understand the hydrogen atom, for example. And um, this star-shaped thing is the distance to various pulsars um, in our vicinity. So this is how we are showing our location. So the Voyagers are currently, I updated these numbers yesterday, um, almost 153 AU and 127 AU away. So they're kind of outside of our solar system, just barely. Um, and they're, you know, still nowhere close to the nearest star. So this sort of message in a bottle is maybe more about uh, us than anyone else. Um, but we're also sending out signals to space. Most of them are by accident. Most of them are just leakage from our own radio communications here on Earth. Um, I guess aliens from far enough away can listen in on our radio and TV, at least out to about 200 light years distant. Um, and in the future, you might expect, you know, with more cable and fiber optic technology, we'll have less and less radio leakage into space. So maybe if we're looking for radio signals from intelligent beings, we would expect to see some early on as they use radio technology and then maybe less later on as they move on to other forms if, the, if their technology you know, follows the progression of ours in any meaningful way. But we have sent at least one um, radio message. This was not really intending to make contact with any suspected intelligent life. It was sent by um, some study scientists as a ceremony for the Arecibo telescope's construction. So you might think about maybe, you know, can we call nearby life or can we visit them? And we definitely cannot travel to other places, right? Even if you're traveling at the speed of some of our fastest, fastest space probes, um, a 200 light year round trip would take 600,000 years. So this is not really reasonable. Um, we can call, but even with Alpha Centauri, we'd have an eight year back and forth time, right? And as I'll show you with the Drake equation, we can estimate the average distance of technological civilizations based on their average lifetime. So if we're optimistic and say that we expect technological civilizations to last about a million years, they'd be about 100 light years apart. So that would be a 200 year call time, which isn't too bad, but it's not very good for, uh, you know, human lifetime scales. So the round trip travel time is a serious problem in terms of making repeated communications. So it, if we do find signals of other intelligent life, it would be pretty hard to carry on a conversation. Um, nevertheless, we are still on the lookout for signs of intelligent life. So SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, has an array of radio telescopes searching for signals. And we would assume that the signals that they have would be structured in such a way that they contain information um, kind of in the same way that we did with the Arecibo message, or maybe something that's maybe a little bit more mathematical, like in the book Contact. Um, but those signals can't be structured in such a regular way that they mimic natural sources like pulsars. So pulsars put out, you know, very regularly timed radio bursts. And so if an extraterrestrial intelligence was trying to communicate with us or vice versa, we should make sure that we don't look like pulsars. Um, why do we use radio? Um, so based on what you remember from radiation, it turns out that radio, you know, doesn't get absorbed by interstellar dust. So it penetrates the galaxy. So if we want to communicate with intergalactic civilizations, radio is a very good choice. And there are actually specific wavelengths that we are monitoring um, because Actually, the galaxy as a whole has some background radio um, noise. And so we want to make sure that we're outside of that range, which is at fairly low frequencies. And we also want to make sure that we're outside of the atmospheric window of water. If we assume that habitable worlds have water on their surface, 
it's reasonable to assume they probably have some water vapor in their atmosphere if they're warm enough. And so we don't want wavelengths get that get absorbed um, by water. And so the wavelengths that SETI monitors is in what we call the water hole, which is also kind of like the watering hole. I don't know. It's a good window. If we realize it's a good window, we hope that other intelligent beings would as well. And so if we broadcast, we'd want to broadcast at these range, wavelength ranges and we want to listen in on those ranges as well. Okay, so that's my brief overview of SETI. Um, there's lots of other factors that you need to consider when you're trying to figure out how to decipher such a message or more specifically how to um, exactly where to listen. Um, you might want to, you know, you need to know what frequencies to listen to, what channel to tune your radio dial. Uh, you want to know what sort of encoding you expect in the message, right? You want some, you would assume that there's some structure there, but it can't be a pulsar. Um, and you probably want to make sure that you're, you know, receiving a signal that's actually strong enough that couldn't be some sort of noise signal. So there's lots of design challenges for engineers working with SETI.